Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, today's uh, event uh, hosted by the King's College Wargaming Network. My name is David Banks, and I'm the Academic Director of King's Wargaming Network. And I'm here today to uh, uh, introduce you to Reed Pauly, who's going to be today's speaker. Uh, so just one moment. Um, who's today going to uh, speak on war games and the sources of nuclear restraint. Uh, as you can see here, Reed Pauly is an assistant professor of political science at Brown University and the Dean's, Dean's assistant professor of nuclear security and policy at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And as I said, I'm the academic director here at the King's War Gaming Network. So I'm going to make a few introductory remarks. Uh, while I do so, uh, I just let you uh, make you aware of uh, ways in which you can follow this event online or live tweet the event uh, with a variety of different tags uh, that are there at the bottom of the slide. So thank you all for joining us uh, for the continuation of our public lecture series on advancing wargaming uh, as an academic discipline. And as I say, I'm pleased and uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Reed Pauly with us here live from Providence, Rhode Island, who's going to present on wargaming, nuclear research, research and the intersection of the two. I'm also pleased to see that our events continue to attract such significant interest outside of King's. Uh, we have viewers from 43 different countries across six, six different continents joining us today via Zoom and YouTube. Our audience is drawn from government, industry, think tanks, academia, and beyond. Indeed, over 100 of our attendees today are from academia, which indicates the level of interest wargaming research is generating and the demand that exists for understanding academic best practices surrounding the use of wargaming in research. Understanding these fundamental questions is of increasing importance for two reasons. First, we find ourselves in times of increased strategic uncertainty. The increased securitization of a number of regions in the world, the changing technological and cyber landscapes, the emergence or resurgence of state and non-state threats, and increased environmental pressures, of which COVID-19 has been an acute example, means there is a desire in private policy and research sectors to understand new and old challenges and their interaction with one another. Secondly, and partially as a response to this new strategic environment, there has been a massive increase in the use of and support for wargaming as a method to help increasingly worried policymakers policy understand what we can know and how we can know about the things in an uncertain and dangerous world. Since its establishment over two years ago, the King's Wargaming Network has shared these concerns and realizes that addressing them requires intellectual humility, and a recognition that we need better tools for understanding the changed and changing strategic environment. This need for innovation has contributed to the increased prominence of wargaming as a method, as it promises to address and tackle many of these intellectual and strategic challenges. Over this time, the intellectual community of scholars and designers have become increasingly sensitive to establishing wargaming as a rigorous academic method of inquiry. However, the laying of these foundations is still very much in its infancy, and there is still some way to go. In the acknowledgement of this process and of the future needs, we at King's have developed a new wargaming research and education strategy focused on the development of wargaming as an academic discipline, and it's built on three pillars. First, we are continuing to expand the build capacity. We now have two permanent faculty members of the Department of War Studies who focus on wargaming. I just joined in August 2020 as lecturer in War Studies and Wargaming, and we already have a faculty member here, Dr. Aggie Hurst, who has recently been promoted to senior lecturer as a result of our contributions to Wargaming Scholarship. Second, Dr. Hurst and I have redesigned the Wargaming curriculum at King's, and the War Studies Department will be offering new MA modules on Wargaming analysis and design as soon as next year. Uh, we hope to expand these even further uh, and include uh, offerings to undergraduates. Third, we have a new research program with two components, fundamental research and applied research. The applied research captures the use of wargaming methods to develop and test scholarly theories and answer policy questions. The fundamental research focuses on questions on epistemology, of questions, excuse me, of, on epistemology and methodology. And we are very happy to have welcomed two new PhD students to the Wargaming Network this year, both of whom are directly asking wargame related research questions. This is uh, Bauke Kistemacher and Arnold David. This brings our number of PhDs actively investigating or using wargaming in their research to five, which includes uh, my co-director Ivanka Barzashka and founding King's Wargaming Network members uh, Anna Nettleship and James Smith. 
Today's speaking engagements contributes further to developing wargaming as an academic discipline. It continues our lecture series on developing wargaming in an effort to advance fundamental research in it, a series that began late last year with a presentation by Elizabeth Bartels from Rand. The focus of this lecture series is on breakthrough scholarship on wargaming that advances its theory and its applications. And so this afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's talk, Dr. Reed Parley, who, as I said before, is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Brown University and assistant, Dean's Assistant Professor of Nuclear Security and Policy at the Watson Institute. Dr. Parley's research focuses on coercion and nuclear weapons proliferation, strategic secrecy, excuse me, tacit cooperation between adversaries, deterrence theory, and Arctic security. This research is often intersected with another of his major research focuses, the use of wargaming in policymaking and research, including a recent piece on using wargaming to forecast catastrophic events such as pandemics. Today, Dr. Paul will be presenting on two of his most recent academic pieces. His 2008 international security piece, Would US Leaders Push the Button? War Games and the Sources of Nuclear Restraint. In this piece, Dr. Parley investigated declassified records of nuclear war games to determine whether and why policymakers would agree to nuclear weapons use. And he's also presenting uh, some of his uh, 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 findings from a piece currently under review, co-authored with Eric Lynn Greenberg and Jacqueline Snyder, entitled Wargaming for Political Science Research, in which Dr. Parley and his co-authors have offered researchers guidelines and best practices on how to use war games for theory testing and development how to examine issues of bias, validity, and generalizability, and, and to, how to use games to shed light on micro foundations that underpin theories. Considering his experience with addressing wargaming related questions from both policymaking and academic angles, I'm certain we're gonna learn very much uh, from Dr. Polly's presentation today. Now, just before I turn it over to Dr. Polly, uh, let me just lay out a few ground rules for this event. Um, he, uh, Dr. Paul will speak approximately for 45 to 60 minutes, uh, after which uh, he will take uh, questions. Considering the very large number of attendees at this event and the constraints of hosting events such as these online, I'm gonna ask that interested parties place their questions in the designated Q&A space at the bottom of the Zoom screen uh, and not in the comments section. Now I encourage people, if they wish to make comments throughout the talk to do so, and we often have lively debates and chats in that comment section. Uh, but for anyone who wants to ask a question directly to Dr. Polly after his presentation, please do make sure you place them in the Q&A section because that is where they're going to be drawn from. Uh, once uh, the talk ends, I'll be fielding those questions directly uh, to Dr. Polly. So with uh, no more ado, uh, let me please uh, introduce Dr. Polly and uh, I look forward to his presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that introduction, Davey. Uh, can you see my slides now? We can. Excellent. So th thank you to uh, Ivanka and Davey for uh, inviting me to, to speak with you today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, speaking with the Warga Wargaming Network um, about my work on uh, nuclear weapons and political military wargaming. I'm going to do two things uh, in this talk. Uh, uh, hopefully uh, coming in uh, under an hour. Um, and the first is to present some of my research that was published in the Quarterly Journal International Security, uh, uses evidence from political military war games uh, to test IR theory. And, and I believe the link to the article was in fact sent um, to you in the um, invitation. Um, but second, because as David was saying, I, I think many in the audience will be interested in this research as an application of wargaming methods uh, and evidence for scholarship. I'm gonna pivot uh, near the end to a broader discussion of the methodological advantages and challenges of using war games to study international relations, just from the perspective of uh, a scholar of international relations trained in political science and not in uh, war gaming um, uh, practition. Uh, so I am very interested in your thoughts then um, uh, across dis disciplinary lines. Um, uh, uh, this piece, that I am talking mainly about has come out, but I'm hoping to do more work, uh, collect more archival evidence from, uh, uh, from historical war games and to test other theories in the future. So our conversation will be quite useful to me going forward. So uh, let's just begin with, with a big research question that I asked. Um, why have nuclear weapons not been used since 1945? 
right? So many in international relations in my field have been uh, proposing theories, uh, answers to explain this empirical regularity, and they've all struggled to overcome the core methodological, methodological challenge of studying a dependent variable that does not vary. So nuclear weapons have been employed in war twice and not since 1945. Uh, I thought it was worth taking another uh, crack at this puzzle. Uh, first, because uh, just in reviewing the literature in IR, uh, I was uh, a little dismayed that the, that the theories have become somewhat muddied in their explication of alternative uh, logics of non-use. And second, because uh, efforts to generate empirical evidence to study this question have turned recently to, to surveys and survey experiments where respondents are members of the public uh, using what we call convenient samples. And as I learned more about the accessibility of political military uh, war gaming records in the archives, I thought we had a neat opportunity here to test theories um, on uh, an elite sample. And I'll say much more about that shortly. Um, I also think that, that this is a, a, an important moment to be doing more work of uh, this nature. Nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy are uh, somewhat reemergent uh, and central to issues of American foreign policy. Uh, the prospect of using nuclear weapons is now not uncommon uh, to surface in debates about how to handle American adversaries. Uh, and uh, the unconventional presidency of Donald Trump uh, raised uh, renewed conversations about command and control and uh, renewed legislative efforts to try and restrict, restrict presidential nuclear launch authority. And so all these debates are percolating much more now um, in the public. And suffice it to say from a disciplinary perspective that this is a central question of, of the field um, and we don't have a consensus answer on it yet. So first step in, in testing theory um, in war games or, or any method is to be very clear about the alternative theories and their logics that we're trying to test. So I broke up the existing literature into what I see are five logics of nuclear non-use. And in reviewing the literature, you could be forgiven uh, for uh, being confused uh, about what authors mean when they try and explain uh, the non-use of nuclear weapons since 1945. So, Theorists of the nuclear revolution, Brody, Schelling, Jervis, Waltz, these are just core theorists of the nuclear revolution that established the logic of deterrence. Um, you know, it came up with a logical um, and widely accepted uh, idea, but that for explaining the puzzle of nuclear non-use since 1945 fell short because it cannot explain the non-use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear armed adversaries. And this is where things got muddy in the literature. So uh, famously, John Lewis Gaddis uh, used the term self-deterrence, but Scott Sagan also used the sel term self-deterrence by which they mean different things. Uh, Scott Sagan and T.V. Paul also developed um, theories on the tradition of non-use uh, by which again, they mean different things. And Nina Tannenwald famously uh, coined the term nuclear taboo, which scholars went on to use um, sometimes in ways she did not intend. Schelling, for example, Thomas Schelling um, used the term taboo and tradition interchangeably. Um, so uh, my first contribution, and, and, and just to get us all on the same page about the theory being tested here, is to break down these theories into their constituent logics that, that are falsifiable and empirically testable. So bottom line, turns out there's five. Um, they are deterrence, practicality, precedent, reputation, and ethics. And so I'll, I'll walk you through them. The first, again, widely accepted logic is that of deterrence. Here's Winston Churchill's early expression of the concept. This is the theory of the nuclear revolution. Nuclear weapon states with survivable arsenals will not threaten each other's core interests. Nuclear weapon states do not use nuclear weapons out of fear of retaliation in kind. But again, in the record of uh, wars in which nuclear weapons could have been used, this logic cannot explain why, uh, especially the United States has refrained from using nuclear weapons against targets that are incapable of retaliating. Think Korea, Vietnam, Iraq. Uh, and, and so realists had to repair this uh, shortcoming of the deterrence theory with two additional logics of non-use. The first was practicality. Uh, it's possible that non-use of nuclear weapons may be the result of practical military considerations uh, about utility on the battlefield. So 
maybe there's paucity of targets that actually require nuclear effects to degrade. Um, uh, if nuclear capable belligerents can defeat their adversaries at low cost without resorting to nuclear weapons, then non-use is not so puzzling. Here's the uh, uh, oft quoted um, request from Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney to look into nuclear options during the first Gulf War and Chairman uh, Powell's skepticism that they would actually even be tactically useful, um, even on a battlefield uh, in the desert. And the third uh, and last purely realist logic uh, was used uh, uh, to invoke long-term rational self-interest um, and we call this precedent. Leaders might consider that they do not wish to set a precedent for the use of nuclear weapons. So nuclear use today might trigger both further nuclear proliferation and ultimately additional uses of nuclear weapons by others in the future. Uh, this is what's most commonly called the tradition of non-use. And, and here's Colin Powell's uh, uh, explication of we're, we're not going to let that genie loose. And, and Speaker Gingrich's similar argument in the 90s about how we don't wanna live in that world uh, uh, where we've sent a signal to uh, every country that they should get nuclear weapons as fast as they can. The fourth logic is of reputation. Uh, it begins to take us away from the realist lens. So reputation logic argues that nuclear weapon states fear the reputational costs uh, that would follow a nuclear strike and multiple reputations can be at stake. So we could think of a state's reputation for its behavior, uh, perhaps a leader's personal reputation, or even an advisor's personal reputation if they're gonna recommend the option or not. And the audiences of concern are important to nail down, but they can be multiple. So you could think of domestic publics uh, uh, being concerned about my reputation in their eyes or international publics. Uh, perhaps allied governments themselves, or even my policymaking peers. These are all audiences of concern. Uh, and just note that according to this logic, right, leaders are willing to forego the marginal military benefit of using nuclear weapons in exchange for not paying these reputational costs. And it requires, however, noting that decision makers, if they're following reputational logic, believe that there will be reputational costs for the use of nuclear weapons. That is that at least one audience or another would find the use of nuclear weapons worthy of reprimand, okay? Uh, and so the logic of reputation is therefore in part normative. It has a, at least somebody thinks that this is an inappropriate thing to do. Um, here's just on the slide, George Ball um, uh, invoking universal condemnation, this world opinion uh, idea. And there was also an idea that came up uh, often after, um, well, especially in the Korean War after uh, uh, World War II, where the US had already used nuclear weapons in East Asia. And some argued that it didn't want to be known as the ones who, who used the bomb only against Asian victims. So it's a logic of reputation. The final logic in the fifth one is, is ethics. This is normative conceptions of appropriate behavior, like moral or ethical considerations that drive decision makers to nuclear non-use. And these arguments often invoke identity, a self-conception as one who would not use nuclear weapons. So here is, for example, uh, White House Chief of Staff um, John Sununu saying, we just don't do things like that. Right? That's an identity invocation or General Glosson's belief that in the first Gulf War, if we had used nuclear weapons, it would have changed me as a person. Um, I mentioned, uh, uh, but just want to reiterate, right, that the first three of these logics rely on material variables. That's realists who would say states in anarchy cannot afford to be moral. Right? That's a Waltz or, or Bob Art uh, invocation. Uh, but the last two are more normative and they constitute um, uh, uh, logics of appropriateness. It's another way of thinking about this has been done in the literature. Are we concerned about the consequences of our action, the logic of consequences, or are we concerned about the appropriateness of our actions, the logic of appropriateness, where, where we're driven by norms that imply a shouldness of what ought to be done. Okay, and these logics are not incompatible. Uh, normative and material theories can coexist uh, and one evidence of one doesn't preclude the other, but uh, it's important to distinguish them and then compare them and we can test their relative validity. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, scholars who have tried to, to 
shed light on this puzzle before, uh, have proposed these theories and tried to overcome this methodological problem by generating data to study this dependent variable that doesn't vary. And they've done so in very creative ways. Um, one of the, the field altering series of studies that did so recently, that many of you may have heard of, um, was this study uh, or series of studies by um, Scott Sagan, Ben Valentino, and, and, and the earliest study, Daryl Press was a co-author. I was very fortunate to be a research assistant on that earliest project. Uh, and it inspired some of the work that I'm continuing to do. But they're using survey experiments to find evidence that the American public is surprisingly willing to support or approve of the use of nuclear weapons in war, including against cities. So they did this by uh, giving their survey respondents a scenario, a fake New York Times style newspaper article in which the Joint Chiefs of Staff offers their assessment of the effectiveness of nuclear versus conventional options to destroy, in this case, a, a terrorist facility. And the two main findings that I've always found most surprising um, and that they highlight are one that nearly 20% of Americans support using nuclear weapons regardless of whether their tactical effects are necessary, uh, according to the Joint Chiefs, to destroy uh, the target. This is the so-called nukem faction. Let's use nuclear weapons regardless. The second result, uh, major finding, is what they, the authors call the rally around the bomb effect. Uh, that is, there's retrospective majority support for the use of nuclear weapons if respondents are told that the U.S. military already did it. Right? So, and then Sagan and Valentino went on to show um, in another study that the uh, American people are willing to support a Hiroshima-like bombing in a Hiroshima-like scenario in a hypothetical war against Iran today. And so these studies are scary and uh, I highly recommend you read through them. They're fascinating, very important. Um, and, and they suggest that the normative prohibition on the use of nuclear weapons is weak. But remember, they are surveying members of the public. And so while fascinating, uh, I don't think this research sheds light on the effects that the logics of non-use that I just walked through would actually have on decisions to use nuclear weapons in crisis, simply because of the fact that the general public is not empowered to make decisions about the use of nuclear weapons. And so in, in uh, disciplinary terms, nuclear restraint may be an elite phenomenon. And it's an unfortunately dismissive term, elite, uh, but it's an accepted one in my discipline, and so I, I, I do use it. Um, but what we really mean is that an elite sample is similar in some meaningful characteristic, like education, uh, skills, uh, experience, um, to those policymakers or leaders who would actually make this decision in a real world crisis. So one path forward, uh, if you wanted to do this kind of work, would be to survey elites, and people do this. Um, uh, successfully. Uh, getting a representative sample is difficult. But second of all, when you can reach um, policymakers to survey them, there's a, a question we all have about whether they're going to be honest with you. It's not because they're dishonest people by any means. It's that uh, when they are asked a question and they believe that they are in a position of uh, leadership or could see themselves again in a position of leadership, there's some level of signaling that's happening, right? Of what they're going to say in public versus what they're actually, uh, 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 the considerations they'll actually make in a real world crisis. So my proposed solution was to look at war games played by elite policymakers. Uh, and let me tell you a bit about the war games data. Um, it's a very specific set of archival data from a golden age, I think, of elite policymaker participation in crisis simulations. Uh, and it, it may be, I'm sure, is different from other kinds of war games that you uh, have all uh, experienced and continue to, to run. Um, and I'd love to hear about those as well. But I'm going to tell you about this archival game records uh, before I come back to saying more uh, about general propositions about the value of war gaming methods um, and these particular war gaming methods to the study of international relations. So it's not really, I don't think, for me to tell you that there's lots of different kinds of war games. Um, 
and, and there seem to be many definitions of them, but the photos here on the screen are not the kind that I'm about to tell you about. Um, you know, they're from Rand, the Naval War College and, and places we all know. The important thing for the purposes of my project is that wargaming underwent this uh, change in the beginning of the nuclear age. It shifted from, uh, there was a shift in, in interest in wargaming from militaries and think, uh, uh, think tanks to the civilian academy. So scholars tried to strip away the operational and tactical detail in favor of testing political and strategic dynamics in games. Uh, things like the process of escalation, uh, signaling and commitment or demonstrating resolve. Right? So war games were supposed to not just be for military personnel anymore, they were turned into po political military war games and became influential in the academy. Uh, and these were the games that I went looking to gather in the archives. Uh, ga these games designed by academics, and in particular, the games designed by political scientist Lincoln Bloomfield at MIT and economist uh, Tom Schelling at Harvard. They partnered in the late 1950s to try and develop their own uh, wargaming methodology. And they made two key choices um, uh, it, it, to, to drive their uh, methodological choices. The first was they felt that the war games they had experienced, mostly through the Rand Corporation, had quote, limits that were always decided in advance. They didn't leave room for an analysis of the dynamics of escalation and Schelling wanted to allow for, quote, a process of feeling around for what the other side might accept or reject. And anyone familiar with Thomas Schelling's bargaining theories will understand that what he's trying to do is find a way to test them uh, without having to look to the real world. And the second uh, choice they made is that they decided against role playing in their games. They wanted deep engagement and deliberation within teams of what they called homogenous responsibility. So they, they ran several games in Cambridge, uh, a couple at Camp David, and then in 1961, when the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, stood up uh, their, their in-house gaming division, they imported Schelling and Bloomfield's method of political military gaming, and, and in fact asked Schelling and Bloomfield to direct some games for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So basic design, um, is red versus blue teams, but very often more than two in separate rooms, moderated by a control team, confronting a hypothetical crisis that they receive a briefing and, and briefing materials on, and then deciding on military or diplomatic moves in a series of rounds, control updating the scenario according to submitted courses of action and contingency plans. Uh, and games that ended with a critique session where all players in this hot wash afterwards um, uh, would get together and discuss what decisions they made in the game and why. So the records of these games, I think, offer a rare opportunity to study the behavior of elite policymakers in a simulation. Participation, uh, participation was military and civilian. Uh, it extended up to the cabinet level uh, but never the president, interestingly. Uh, Schelling um, uh, has a lot to say about why the president should not uh, participate in, in war games, to telegraph anything that he or she would do in the real world. But uh, players included National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, Deputy National Security Advisor Carl Kaysen, Assistant Secretary of Defense John McNaughton, and the list goes on. You, you get a sense reading these documents that it was a time before the tyranny of the inbox, right, that would keep policymakers from spending a whole day uh, devoted to uh, uh, a simulation. And so these, these professionals are plausibly similar to those who could have been in a position to recommend whether to use nuclear weapons in a real world crisis. The participants knew that their decisions would be anonymized or classified uh, or otherwise protected um, privately for years. Uh, and they devoted significant time and energy to these games. And then for the purpose of studying um, the non-use of nuclear weapons or use and non-use of nuclear weapons, these war games um, in political science terms, I think serve as most likely cases to observe a rare phenomenon. If we expect to see decision makers use or approve the use of nuclear weapons anywhere, it might be in a simulation um, where in the words of one war game report, quote, if you lose, it's not for keeps. <laughs> 
So let me just put a, a pin um, briefly in that methodological discussion because I'm gonna come back after I tell you what I, uh, more about these games and what I found. Um, I'm gonna come back to, to think about what we still need to know about whether and when war games are useful for testing international relations theory. So I reviewed records or partial records of uh, a few dozen war games that I found in, in presidential libraries. The CIA's uh, Crest archive is helpful. Declassified documents online database has some of these and especially the archives at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where uh, Lincoln Bloomfield papers are today. Um, of these games are reviewed, the 26 on the screen are those that met my selection criteria for open-ended, non-scripted political military war games with strategic elite players and that allowed for the consideration of the use of nuclear weapons. Of course, the most common reason for uh, exclusion of a game from the sample is simply the lack of data. Um, uh, sometimes we have invitations, briefing materials, but nothing else about what actually happened in the game, and that's too bad, but I've filed um, uh, FOIAs, mandatory classification reviews, and we, we will see what uh, comes out in the years ahead, but uh, have to be very patient with that kind of thing. Um, all of the games that you see on the screen uh, uh, ha happened between 1958 and 1972. And for the purpose of testing theories of nuclear non-use, it's important to note the two columns they're separated into. That's 13 uh, war games that included only nuclear armed teams wherein deterrence logic should be uh, primary. Um, and 13 war games that included non-nuclear armed teams as well. So one team has an unmatched nuclear advantage over an opponent, at least one opponent. And um, uh, you, within those games, you also have to control for extended deterrence. As an aside here, um, I, I have a question for all of you and interested in, in your feedback on this. Um, I'm still not entirely sure whether I've coded this data appropriately in terms of what counts as a quote unquote observation uh, in political science language, right? So it's a little bit incorrect to say that I have 26 observations, that uh, each, each game actually has tens of players uh, and these theories of nuclear non-use should apply at the individual level, but the transcripts are anonymized uh, and so I can't code observations at the individual level with much confidence, but I uh, sometimes triangulation is possible with, with other documents. So, you know, I can guess who is saying what, but that's really not possible systematically. I could code them by team, right? We could say that each team is an observation and I'd love to know whether or not you think I should do that instead of counting individual games as observations. But uh, here's just an example of the records, what they look like. Sometimes you get final reports, other times you get initial briefing materials and fact books, uh, participant lists as well. Here's a look inside, uh, just one. Uh, they vary uh, greatly between them, but on the right is the post-game critique, the uh, uh, elite participants in their own words, describing, explaining, uh, justifying their actions. You can see that it's anonymized. Um, it's just labeled red or blue player, um, yellow or green player. Uh, and, and I can sometimes triangulate, as I said, but it's very difficult to do. So here's what, what we find. Um, I divide my results into two types of data that I think war games can offer scholars. Uh, the first is outcome data. That is what actually happened in the war game. Um, uh, for my purposes is did players cross the nuclear threshold or not? Uh, and the second is deliberative data. That is what players discussed. Um, this is process data. Um, uh, what we would call if this was a case study, um, causal process observations. And I'd refer you, uh, I'm glad to know that, that um, she was just here last time, I'd refer you to Rand um, Ellie Bartels' great work, um, a more comparison between case study methods and war gaming. So in terms of outcomes uh, in the sample, elite players were reluctant to cross the nuclear threshold. Uh, and this finding holds for games that have both nuclear armed states and non-nuclear armed uh, adversaries. Um, even in, in cases where the players acknowledge that nuclear use would be tactically advantageous. Uh, and so only two out of 26 games crossed the nuclear threshold. As for deliberative 
uh, data. I'm, I'm then coding player language uh, in the reports according to whether a particular aversion to nuclear use surfaces. So for those familiar, this, this approach is akin to uh, Nina Tannenwald's concept of taboo talk, where she went to the historical records of, inter of uh, American uh, sides of, of international crises and observed um, uh, references to normative constraint, right? And so in this project, in, in war game reports, I'm similarly looking for not only taboo talk, but it divided into reputation talk or ethics talk and contrasting it with more material concerns about deterrence talk, concerns for consequences like practical or uh, practicality talk or consequences like precedence talk. Um, and I had some excellent RAs at Stanford University that helped me to check uh, these codings. So the next two charts are just going to show you the logics that were invoked in these games. Player aversion to nuclear use um, comported most strongly with deterrence, practicality, and reputation. Uh, so deterrence logic, uh, of course, abounds. Uh, it's not surprising. Um, but practicality and reputation still kept players from using nuclear weapons. Uh, and interestingly, strict ethical arguments and precedent concerns were uncommon. Now, of course, these charts uh, are just um, illustrative of the variation I observe. Uh, and the paper uh, goes into a much greater detail on several games. But I just want to give you a flavor of some vignettes today. Um, non-use of nuclear weapons in these games was not for lack of consideration. There are many great episodes of players suggesting nuclear use only to be laughed at or dissuaded or otherwise argued against. Uh, many simulated Berlin crises with the Soviet grab of Berlin or, or uh, West German territory um, remain conventional even though actual NATO war plans called for tactical nuclear use in some uh, similar scenarios. Um, players in escalating Vietnam scenarios rejected the option of using nuclear weapons against even non-nuclear capable um, Chinese forces uh, uh, that were hypothetically in, uh, um, invading. Uh, and so here's just some of the language. Epsilon 72, um, it postulated US uh, Soviet skirmishes on the uh, inner German border as well as the Soviet invasion of Finland and Norway. And the members of the blue team called the option of tactical nuclear use too dangerous because they were unwilling to risk Soviet counter escalation. Right? So most people would agree this is just deterrence at work. And, and Thomas Schelling's uh, 1961 Berlin crisis games had a participant who said, if we do something too tough, we will start a rapid escalation uh, and we will have no idea where it will end. So it, it's this deterrence, I don't think it's too controversial to say that, that we can code that language. But other deliberative data is more ambiguous. Um, in a war game centered on an East-West crisis uh, in Iran, Schelling told his players uh, in a post-game review that, that blue and red had come closer to nuclear war than they appreciated because red had privately laid out some criteria for responding to blue aggression uh, with nuclear weapons that blue had discussed, at, although ultimately dismissed, um, uh, that would have triggered those red contingencies. So Schelling asked his participants, doesn't that mean we uh, at least came close to using nuclears? Uh, and the deputy head of the CIA and a red team member, Richard Bissell, who was playing, responded that, Tom, I'm not sure we really meant it. In a 1966 uh, new um, uh, Greek letter, NU, uh, new war game series involving uh, a two front war between India and Pakistan and India and China. Uh, a US team player uh, went on the assumption, quote, that the US wouldn't ever use the bomb first. And he called it a paper bomb. Uh, going on to say they might as, might as well be uh, locked up on a shelf um, as, as far as our considerations were concerned. As for considerations of uh, the use of nuclear weapons against uh, non nuclear armed opponents, Chinese forces were massing along the border uh, of Vietnam in the Sigma 264 game, where um, Control then asked the blue team multiple times, 
whether they would pre-delegate launch authority to the local commander, explaining why it was necessary. And multiple times they were denied. Blue players explained their thinking afterwards, saying that they had a general estimate of US policy that they would be reluctant to cross the nuclear threshold. And they pointed to US domestic and world revulsion toward the use of nuclear weapons to back up their assessments. So again, these are just examples. Uh, I also want to tell you a little bit about um, how the players in the games that did go nuclear stumbled into it. So I, I think it is fascinating that the only two war games in, in the sample that did cross the nuclear threshold were in fact games with adversaries capable of nuclear retaliation. These were just US Soviet um, uh, crises over um, uh, Germany and Berlin. And in, in the 1967 beta one, war game that envisioned a European theater where U.S. forces had been reduced to a mere three divisions. And the Soviets seized West Berlin and, and the United States, uh, the blue team, decided to counterattack through East German territory. But of course, they got bogged down being conventionally uh, inferior. And so they used tactical nuclear weapons to aid their pinned down divisions. Um, and they did this twice. And the second time uh, that the blue team used nuclear weapons, they, it included a, a salvo from submarine launched um, warheads that were stationed in the Atlantic. And the Soviet team responded by conducting a preemptive combined counterforce urban attack against the continental United States, to which the United States responded in kind, global thermonuclear war. So post game, the US team explained their, their first tactical use of nuclear weapons, saying that the United States preferred not to use nuclear weapons, but in what may be a horrifying simulacrum of reality, at the last minute when we couldn't think of anything else to do, someone said, redaction. Uh, and a second participant concurred that if the US team had had more time to talk, it probably would have decided not to use nuclear weapons after all. This is just, this is post hoc reasoning. They did, after all, in the game, use nuclear weapons. But on the Soviet side, it is fascinating to see that in the game records, Red's willingness to preempt at the strategic level was actually submitted to control earlier in the game as a Soviet uh, contingency plan, right, to use strategic nuclear weapons first if the US team used nuclear weapons uh, from outside the theater of war. And so when that contingency arose, that is the submarine salvo, um, control carried out the general nuclear war plan for the Soviet team without first allowing them to deliberate or reconsider the option. So the red team never really actually gave the, the nuclear launch order um, uh, they only gave it as a contingency. And then the players, of course, questioned whether they would have made the same decision had they been given a second chance in their post-game deliberations or discussions. Okay, so here's just the, the summary of a few things I think we can learn from these reports. And by the way, all of these uh, reports are either in uh, a Dataverse appendix um, that is linked on my website. Um, or uh, if an archive did not give me permission uh, to post them, uh, their records publicly online, uh, then I, I welcome participants to email me and I'll, I'll point you in the right direction to see any of these records. But here's what I think we can learn. Um, first of all, American elite uh, policymakers are not as likely to use the bomb as studies revealing the nuclear permissiveness of the American public would suggest. Uh, the logic of deterrence, practicality, and reputation prove the most common in war games. And we see, interestingly, a distinct lack of uh, ethics logic, um, but fairly common reputation logic, which suggests that to the extent that nuclear non-use is driven by a taboo, it may function more by a mechanism of conformity than morality. Uh, just as Nina Tannenwald says in, in um, her book on the nuclear taboo, that, that uh, normative logics may reinforce the project practice of deterrence, I find evidence that logics of consequence and appropriateness are operating in conjunction in these games. And there's a lot more work to do here. I, I think that's exciting uh, that could be done. And one thing I'll flag is just that um, 
We don't understand a lot about the reputational costs among peers as a driver of elite behavior. Players saying that they personally didn't want to be known as a warmonger, which we see examples of in the games, um, are fascinating to me. Uh, and they're quite different from what the explication of those theories of reputation in the literature would expect. That is an expression of concern for the reputation of one's country or the reputation of leaders. And of course, there's lots of caveats here, right? I've only shown you records of US war games with American players, uh, all white men, as far as we can tell, within a particular context of historical uh, technology and, and doctrine. Um, but, but I do hope that, that this allows you to see how wargaming data might be used to test international relations theory. Um, though you really shouldn't believe me yet, um, without more evaluation of the advantages and challenges of doing so. So that's why I wanna uh, spend the, the remaining few minutes of my talk teeing up are some of the work that I'm doing um, with colleagues to try and establish this research agenda uh, that might do even more to evaluate some of the claims that I, even I have made today about the value of war games data to test uh, international relations theory. Uh, and this should be especially useful for those social scientists who are more and more interested these days in wanting to design and run their own games. So I think war games can be useful to uh, um, study the beliefs and behaviors of elite subjects themselves, but we should note that that debate is far from resolved in the fields. So Jackie Snyder at Stanford and Eric Lynn Greenberg at MIT and I have um, a working paper um, that, that Davey mentioned and that is, is um, online at the um, Social Science Research Network uh, database, SSRN, where we're just distilling these claims about the value of war games data into four propositions that uh, need more empirical testing. I'll just run through these, these propositions for you and, and talk a little bit about what I think archival records can tell us about them. The first proposition is the war games are more immersive than other methods uh, and therefore more externally valid. Right? The results uh, are more externally valid. And think of this as wondering who spends more time and energy in deliberation as a research subject. Is it the online survey respondent or is it the war game player? And in my historical sample, um, although they are not actual crises, we do see examples of, of players uh, who seemingly uh, had uh, uh, invoked emotions, uh, hubris, pride, and reputations that can come into play in policymaking in the real world. Thomas Schelling, in, in his reflections, uh, described participants in his games as players who virtually lived the games. Um, and he said that it was difficult to spend so many hours in a simulation, quote, without beginning to seem without its beginning to seem either real or as a crisis that could be real. Uh, and we have a little bit of quantitative evidence um, of a survey of players in political military war games at MIT held um, between the late 50s and early 60s that found that 65% of players uh, um, reported an either extreme or intense degree of emotional involvement in the games they played. So uh, but the second and very much related proposition is that war game players, without even really being told, perceive consequences to their actions in games. Uh, and this could be because they know that the results of these games they're playing in are gonna be used to inform some kind of um, decision in the real world, the policy choice that they care about getting right. Or it could very simply be because of a competition that's happening in the games, a competitive nature that shines through. When you're on a team and you feel responsible to either win or at least not screw up this crisis, sense of that responsibility. And another way of thinking about this social scientific terms, right, is that at the extreme, players might forget that they are being studied. And so even though it should be impossible to remove Hawthorne or uh, observer bias effects um, in games. 
we might do better in war games compared to other methods on that score. The third uh, proposition and one that I've already made several claims about um, in this talk is that war games contain more representative samples. So the thinking goes that if scholars are interested in understanding something about the behavior of leaders or policymakers, then they had better find a more externally valid research sample whose level of education, expertise, or experiences are, are similar to uh, those leaders or policymakers. Now this feels intuitive, right? But it's actually not established in the political science literature. In fact, um, Joshua Kurtzer, um, a professor at Harvard, recently published a meta-analysis of survey experiments published in political science journals and compared the findings between elite and public samples to reveal very little difference in the, the results of those surveys, right? But we still might think that whether you need an elite sample or what we call a convenience sample, um, should depend on the research question. So maybe if you're studying something esoteric like nuclear policy, uh, you need some expertise in statecraft or, or at least it's helpful to have taken a class in strategy. Um, and many of you might be familiar here with the work of Andrew Reddy and his colleagues at the Project on Nuclear Gaming uh, who are gathering data to help us do this uh, kind of comparison between elite and public samples. And they've already had a fruitful, fruitful um, exchange on this score that I'm sure many of you have already read in science um, with uh, Jenny Oberholzer and, and her um, former colleagues at RAND. But I also think we do have some evidence from uh, the archival records uh, to suggest a difference between these two types of samples. So when the Joint War Games Agency invited uh, who they described as uh, business executives, labor leaders, and representatives of the entertainment industry. Uh, one gets a sense that they basically are inviting their friends in for a kind of show and tell session at the Pentagon um, where they could uh, play these games um, uh, and, and, and for themselves and see uh, uh, how the method works in the bowels of the Pentagon. Um, the, the, Joint War Games Agency reflections say that they were, quote, surprised by how ready their guests were to go nuclear. And professors um, observed this, the same thing in universities, right? So Lincoln Bloomfield uh, uh, has uh, notes in his papers where he says, if you want a thermonuclear war to break out in a game, you just get some high school students in and you get a thermonuclear war. But with responsible people, you get ambiguous, gray, shadowy situations where you do not look at your weapons as closely as you want to, uh, end quote. The fourth and final proposition is that um, war games are better for studying group decision making, which is after all what policy making entails, deliberation with colleagues and advisors. I think this is a fascinating path forward, and I really would love to hear if anyone knows um, of game designers who are deliberately varying team composition in order to see its effects. Uh, you know, one could imagine doing so along the lines of um, diversity, gender, experience, um, some measure of hawkishness, whatnot, um, maybe hierarchy, right? But within um, archival records, there is a, a pattern I find that I think is important in this regard. Um, uh, to understand and it is a study of group interaction. And that's this, this pattern of player conformity to the recommendations of top-down signals about what players thought more senior officials or the president would actually approve of. So this comes up with players saying things like they considered nuclear use, but quote, national policy would not approve. Or one player ruling out the option of nuclear use because um, uh, concurrently in the real world, President Johnson was campaigning against Barry Goldwater right, and painting himself as the reasonable candidate against the crazy uh, nuclear hawk that Barry Goldwater was. And so uh, therefore that Johnson would, would not want to see a, a nuclear option raised. This is fascinating, right? I, I think um, this means that there is an element of comporting oneself in these war games along the lines of what I ought to do 
uh, in a crisis rather than a, a what I would do in a crisis. And that's important to note for the purposes of measurement. We might also think uh, about this in terms of hierarchy on a team. So for instance, uh, I was really grateful um, going through uh, the MIT archives to find a, a one MIT rapporteur whose note uh, was just slotted loose leaf into uh, uh, the, the uh, archive files um, that noted uh, uh, that from this rapporteur's perspective, Walt Rostow uh, during a 1960 war game, uh, Walt Rostow who would, would go on um, that next year to become deputy national security advisor, uh, quote, did, Walt Rostow, quote, did an estimated 75% of the talking on the U.S. team, and it was only a slight overstatement to say that he was the team, right? And I think this, this note just strikes me as how uh, evidence of how important it is to track systematically this kind of data and not leave it on the table. And so, and in general, going to these uh, records from, uh, from the archives, it just strikes you that that a lot of the speech evidence that one could capture um, is so often not captured in games. And I, I think we should think big about capturing even more of it. And whether that means speech evidence or, or uh, for reasons of concern or bias, not wanting to do that, but capturing instead biometric evidence or simply more deliberative data above and beyond outcome data, uh, that is, uh, exciting for scholars like me. Now, so let me leave it there um, and uh, uh, get your, your questions and insights because I'm really looking forward to your reactions to learning more uh, uh, about your perspectives on these games. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Reed. And if you, um, you can leave your slides up if you like, or you can put them down if you feel like it's easier to see the screen, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, and thank you very much for that very, very interesting uh, talk and presentation. We have a number of people here uh, who are eager to ask you some questions and uh, just to give a sense of the range of attendees. We've got people dialing in from uh, the UK, obviously from places like London and Bath and Huddersfield, but also from as far afield as Louisiana, Virginia, uh, Toronto, Rio de Janeiro, Italy, Germany and many other places beyond. So um, um, there's a wide range of people who are interested. So um, what I'm going to do here is there's a number of questions that have appeared in the chat over the course of your discussion and I'm going to just propose them to you. I might bundle some of them together because some of them sort of speak to one another. Uh, but the first one here is uh, from uh, Iona Lika and I hope, I, say, I hope I'm saying your name correctly Iona, uh, which is about your research design or rather about your kind of prominent alternatives or your possible explanations for, for non-nuclear use or nuclear non-use, I should say, uh, which is why law is not on your list of why nuclear weapons haven't been used since 1945. So as Anna points out, international law prohibits the use of nuclear weapons and ethical debates. International law is frequently used as an extra argument against the use of nuclear weapons. Oh, and sorry, just before we begin, sorry, I'm very sorry to say, I, we have approximately in the chat right now about nine or 10 questions. So just to be conscious of that in your answers. But so once again, sorry about that. Why is law great. not on your list of nuclear weapons? That is a, that is a good question. So um, uh, you might be thinking, right, um, uh, about the exciting new research by uh, Charlie Carpenter um, and David Montgomery, um, uh, or her co-authors, that, that is uh, trying to improve upon the survey experiments that have been done by introducing what they thought was a missing factor in, in the um, uh, survey uh, data or the, the hypothetical situations, the scenarios that were presented to respondents that left out anything about whether this uh, hypothetical strike would be legal or not. Um, and, and so uh, I, I, I think that it's missing, right, from those surveys. It doesn't seem to me that that illegality is a separate logic uh, of non-use. I think that illegality, it would include uh, the logics of ethics, right? That, that we need to codify this norm. We need to write down this norm, right? In order to maybe strengthen it, um, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, 
hope that that improves uh, the restraining effect of the norm. I think it would also be fascinating, and there's no reason why we wouldn't see in a report discussion of legality. And so it is important to note um, for this questioner that we don't see those discussions in these war games reports. That's a fascinating um, uh, uh, finding that I guess I don't highlight in the paper and I probably should. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll leave it there to, t to tee up the work that is forthcoming on this. We should be seeing, let me just clarify what we expect, right? It will not be surprising to find, as Charlie Carpenter and her, her co-authors do, that when you tell people that a nuclear strike would be illegal, uh, that support for their use will go down. What matters going forward then, and they have a, a debate with Scott Sagan and Ben Valentino on this, uh, is that even if you tell a respondent right, that something would be illegal, it doesn't mean that uh, an, a, an illegal nuclear option would not be discussed internally and then modified into something that would be um, uh, um, justified as legal by the JAG teams that are working at STRATCOM to make sure that nuclear options are legal, right? And so former STRATCOM commanders right, say this in public now right, about how none of the options that they present are illegal because they've all gone through the process of, of JAG uh, review to, uh, uh, to be legal strikes. Um, and so there's then this, this puzzle about what does that mean for the real world considerations of the use of nuclear weapons. If the president asks for a strike package that, some, that one lawyer or another would say is illegal, is it up to the STRATCOM uh, folks to say, or and, and other advisors to say, no, that's illegal? Or is it up to them to find a legal option that is similar? All right. I'll leave there. Thanks, great <clears throat> question. No, that's, very, that's very, a very interesting answer. Um, a question here from Robin Ferguson. Um, she said, great presentation and article. And you know, I know you mentioned this a little bit uh, in your comments, but could you share a little bit more detail on how you approached access to the archives supporting your research? And if I can throw Ryder onto that, which is how did you identify the, the archives, uh, the necessary archives? Um, yeah, okay, so uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about my process. I started this as a graduate student at MIT. And so the very first thing I did was, um, well, actually, let me back up. The, really, the very first thing I did was, as a student, look up on the wall and see that there was a, a, a plaque that commemorated the war games um, that were run by Lincoln Bloomfield, right? It's sort of um, uh, history of the Center for International Studies and the Security Studies Program at MIT uh, that, that uh, uh, celebrates a little bit of the history. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder where the records are of those. So the, then I went to the MIT archives and Lincoln Bloomfield's papers are there. And so I started at the MIT archives. But by following that thread and finding through that that uh, the Lincoln Bloomfield and Schelling ended up running games for the Joint War Games Agency, then I went to presidential archives thinking and hoping, also for convenience because the Kennedy archive is, is in Boston, um, and, and then um, uh, hoping that I would find these records. And once I did at the Kennedy archive, I uh, managed to get some money to you know, go uh, travel to additional presidential archives. Um, so it was, I, I guess, it, it, maybe it's unsatisfying, but it's a little bit of a snowballing uh, answer. Snowballing archives. You go to one archive, you find out you have to go to another one. Uh, and it goes from there. Um, and really that means, what it means is that there's an exciting opportunity for better and more work because what my process uh, was limited by was time and resources. So I've never gone to the Reagan archive to see if there's uh, games available from the 80s, right? I kind of doubt it. You can see already in what I was looking at in the archives that um, the records start to trail off as you get into the 1970s. But I, I very much look forward to going to additional archives and seeing 
um, uh, what other work at the very least we can file mandatory declassification reviews to try and get. Um, in terms of access to archives, um, in case this questioner is you know, interested in, in the questions of like what, what can be publicly available, there were no qualms, like ethical concerns or IRB kind of concerns about publicizing you know, um, records from LinkedIn Bloomfield's archives. The MI, there's a, um, everything that's donated to an archive you know, usually comes with some kind of um, estate uh, uh, permissions that say you know, what this information can be used for. So using it for social science purposes, it's totally fine. Um, uh, you know, I think some of the value of the of records that come from presidential archives is that they, and that were games that were run um, in government means that the, the records were classified at one point and that's valuable because the players knew that. And so maybe they spoke more freely, but even at MIT, players knew that the records would be private until uh, Lincoln Bloomfield passed away and gave his records, his estate gave his records um, to the MIT archives. Um, so, so I then, I found it actually very easy to ask archivists for permission to put information online. The only ones that you don't get permission to do that with are the databases that are charging for their databases. So like US declassified documents online for understandable reasons, doesn't want you to publicly post documents that they want you to pay them to access. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question here um, uh, regarding your research design from owner. In the war games you analyzed, is there a change in the level of analysis? Uh, that is to say, can some of them be strategic level where others are operational or tactical? Uh, did, that, did, did you notice that pattern in your, in your data? Yeah, um, great question. So in, in general, these political military war games are trying to strip away that operational detail in favor of the strategic decision making. What's happening um, operationally in, in Schelling's mind is that you know, the movement of bombers is, doesn't so much matter for the military effect of that movement or even bombing of a target, right? It's not about war fighting per se, but it's about the political signal and resolve that that sends. So he's interested in testing these theories about costly signaling and demonstrating resolve. So you are allowed to engage in those operational details, but with these strategic political signaling goals in mind, right? Um, what you, what uh, the Joint War Games Agency seems to innovate later on, uh, it, it in part in an effort to save, it seems, the time of senior participants to, to not require, you know, a, a Carl Kaysen to sit there all day long, is that you can divide a team into senior players and action players. And so the seniors are providing the guidance, and they're saying the strategic objectives they want, but then you allow the game to have more operational detail in the specific moves because it's not then up to the seniors to decide, it's up to their action officers to decide how to interpret those signals. What becomes fascinating then in the post-game discussions are when you bring the seniors back to see what the action officers have done interpreting, interpreting their um, intentions. And sometimes uh, they've interpreted imperfectly. Sometimes you see senior players say, that's not the intention you know, we had. That's not the signal we intended to send. Um, uh, in one Berlin crisis game, I'm thinking of the action officers were more aggressive than the um, senior players had intended them to be. That's very interesting. So that's kind of like the real world too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and has interesting implications for how the game's developing. Um, a question here from uh, Eric uh, Gomez. The war games you examined all took place during the Cold War, while the public surveys are post-Cold War. Do you think the different international system might change elite Sorry, do you think a different international system might change elite restraint that was evident in the Cold War games? Uh, yes, there are lots of reasons to think that this is different. And I think that, that Eric is right to point out that there should be a caveat of this finding, right? This is not a finding that you can necessarily put direct in direct comparison without adding caveats to these survey experiments that have been conducted in, in recent years. This is about uh, the non-use of nuclear weapons between 1958 and 1972 
in political military war games. Um, uh, there is reason to think, um, you know, just deductively from the literature on nuclear non-use, that it should be harder over time to break the tradition of non-use. So the that would be the if we were expressing it as a you know express hypothesis, this literature would think that the longer we go without the use of nuclear weapons, the stronger the prohibition against their use. And so with that in mind, we should see the opposite of what the results are showing us. We should, if you think that um, what I have shown you is more restraint early on and that what others have shown you is less restraint nowadays, uh, that is the opposite of what the tradition of nuclear non-use would expect. That's important to note. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it seems that your data shows that even in that limited time period. Um, a question here from uh, Heather. Now, you sort of addressed this a little bit in your, in your, your presentation, but I, I still think it's worth going into the details here. Um, she says, thank you for the, for the presentation, uh, which she found it fascinating. Uh, but she wants to pull it back to you and say, what do you see as the primary actor uh, and level of analysis and decision making? So who, you know, do you see individuals as the key deci decision makers? Um, or were you able to isolate, was there a key leader in each team? Um, do you believe it's a collective decision? Uh, uh, looking at the teams uh, would make sense and it's justifiable. So like, you know, where are you able to locate the actual leader in, the, in, these, in these groups or were you able to do so? And do you, what implications do you think that have for your research? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Heather. Uh, I don't feel confident enough based on the granularity of the data in these records to, to identify in group dynamics, like whether a player emerged as a leader. Um, we could try, you know, rely on the, the director's um, intent and, and think that, uh, or com be confident that Schelling actually achieved his goal of making teams be of homogenous responsibility, uh, by which he meant, well, by which he meant not having role, role playing, but in addition, having deep deliberation of options among a group of experts who were all equally participating in raising and, and considering options. Um, like, I'm, like I said, seeing that uh, record about Walt Rossow's uh, 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 over uh, uh, representativeness on one US team in 1960 does suggest to me that there's missing data here that we, we um, uh, that it likely happened in other games that we just don't know because the repertoires were not nice enough to add notes like that post hoc for us in the archives. Uh, I think what that means is that as Heather's question, I think is suggesting or that leads us to consider, this is a fruitful area of future research, right? I, I want to see war games that are explicitly varying team composition or, or the responsibility of members within the team to see if that has any effect on, um, well, there's group biases, maybe you get more or less group think, uh, uh, um, whether you have actual uh, hierarchy within a team, or whether you have players who are uh, amongst themselves in the real world equal, but whom you tell uh, uh, to play the roles of, of a hierarchy. Um, yeah, and so that, that is just an exciting path forward. One, one thing I should mention, just to tee up some exciting work, the, the possibility that Jackie Schneider is looking into running some games, I believe at MIT, but maybe she's she's now working on this elsewhere, um, is to try and give participants individual microphones. Because at the very least, not in a, for all kinds of bias reasons, you might not want to tell people that you are capturing everything that they're saying. But instead of just producing a transcript of what an individual is saying, at the very least, if everyone has an individual mic, you can measure the amount that they are speaking. And it would not be surprising, you know, uh, to see um, 
male uh, players talking over female players because we observe that in everyday men's plating interaction all the time. Uh, it would not, not be just surprising to, to try and capture hierarchy in that, um, in, in that sense or deference. Um, it'd be interesting if you could capture interruption. Um, I think that's very exciting. We, we should do that kind of work. Thanks for the question, Heather. Um, so just as something that may have come out of the, the, the research when you're doing it, uh, this is from Pascal uh, Van Overloop. Could you gain any insights on the potential effect of automized nuclear C2 systems, such as the alleged Soviet dead hand system? So did any of the games include these kinds of mechanisms and the rule sets that you were able to identify? Um, great question. Not explicitly. So nothing that I saw um, was, was, you know, imagining a world in which there was a dead hand system operational. Uh, but interestingly enough, the use of nuclear weapons in beta one had that quality, right? Uh, where the decision was, was pre uh, coded ahead of time, as though you had told the machine under what circumstances you were going to use, use um, to launch a preemptive strategic attack. And then instead of getting uh, the opportunity to change your mind, control has that contingency in front of them. And so they just carry it out for you. That's a dead hand like logic, sort of. Um, uh, but no, uh, there was nobody, uh, there were no games in which um, Schelling uh, or, or Bloomfield were, or any other organizers were saying explicitly that say the red team had a dead hand in place, but they did experiment with lots of things in, in interesting ways. So um, in, in some of the games, um, the red team was given uh, uh, more capable than average uh, missile defenses, right? They wanted to see the impacts on strategic stability of missile defenses. Uh, there was also a game where uh, uh, as rounds progressed, the uh, it's either as rounds progressed or as I'm forgetting now whether it's rounds progressed or this between series of the games, uh, the arsenal sizes uh, were coming down and down as though there was an ongoing uh, nuclear arms control strategic stability negotiation uh, uh, taking place that was resulting in lower, lower levels. So to see the effects of, of reduced arsenal size on strategic stability. Okay, great, thank you. You should do one with a dead hand. That'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, that would, right? Um, and so question here from uh, Daniel Rio Tinto, uh, which is just gets a broader discussion of academia and the policy world and the defense establishment. Uh, here he says, I would be interested to know if you have any thoughts on how to engage militaries and defense security establishments across the world to actively participate in the process of using wargaming as a sort of lab in the field. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about this and also and joint initiatives that might allow to circumvent the pro problem of access. I wonder if you've come across this at all in your wargaming research. To circumvent the problem of access to the data as in like war, uh, governments are running these and none of us can see what they come up with. I think that's, yes. He's like, how can we build joint initiatives that allow us to circumvent the problem of access? But I think just yeah. also the general question of how to, in, to create that synergy between military, militaries uh, and, and, and academics and researchers. Well, I, I, I'm sure there's many people in the audience that can answer this question much better than I can. But, but um, I think that's, that's kind of one of the, the purposes of networks like this and, and um, uh, ongoing uh, renewed interest in wargaming, right? Is that so? We all know the, everyone always cites Bob Works' uh, uh, 2015 call for better wargaming because we are at a similar moment today of uh, uh, great power uh, uh, shifts um, and technological uncertainty or rapid technological change. And so we've got to go back like we did in the interwar period to wargame these things. I think that's all like that's happening to the, 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 um, the listener's question, um, to Daniel's question, uh, uh, there's seem, what you're asking for already seems to be in the works. What I'm interested in doing is, is uh, A, helping academia to, uh, to 
participate in that trend. And then also to, to have some encouragement to get to the second aspect of your question, to do just that, to get academics and scholars some of this data that is all happening behind the curtain of government secrecy, or a lot of which is. Uh, and I, I'll give you my thoughts on, on, uh, on without knowing exactly what uh, is happening uh, in the Pentagon since um, uh, uh, Bob Works call for greater war gaming, um, but there was an effort right to to create a repository of war game reports, um, so that one might be able to at the very least learn from the other war games that are happening. Right. So what's the point of us each reinventing the wheel when we run a war game? That's a great idea. From an academic perspective, what you want is then some. Uh, standardization of the data that's coming out of those so that you could start to do a meta-analysis of them right all together and i have heard nothing um uh to suggest that that repository is succeeding in its standardization of reports right it, it, a lot of times when you do this in a bureaucracy what just happens is if you add another checkbox like you have to put your report in this digital Dropbox, it's a checkbox. Nobody is necessarily doing it the right way or going in to standardize the results. Maybe they are, and, and that's wonderful. Going even a step further, it would be amazing if as games, and, and, and if it's really hard to do with, you know, Department of Defense games, that makes sense, but as Naval War College runs more games, as the Rand Corporation runs more games, think tanks run more games, right? Whatever data you can get out of those games, even at a very top line level that you will allow to be unclassified, that is useful. And so we should, as scholars, be pushing for any wargaming institution to be releasing whatever data they are able to release, whatever data their sponsors will allow them to release, right? And we understand that it's not gonna be all of the results of uh, the Air Force's um, you know, uh, simulation of its war in the Pacific um, and all the classified uh, um, uh, inputs that go, in, go into it. But whatever basic uh, uh, standardized uh, outcome and deliberative data we can get out of them, the better. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that's one of the big sort of typical academic things, right, is that access to the data, it should be replicable, whatever you've done. Um, and yeah, finding that standardization would be a great first step. Yeah, well, replicability, I mean, being an even different question, right, about mm -hmm. how much we should have a, should we have a norm in the discipline, uh, right, or in the community about how much of the design elements of your game should be publicly available. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, that there are not only classification issues there, but there's like intellectual property concerns, right? You design a game, it's your, your property isn't necessarily, not everyone has the same incentives as a scholar like I do to like get everything out in the public and, and have other people use uh, your evidence. Okay, unfortunately we're running close to the end of our time here and there's still a number of questions left in the, in the Q and A box. Um, I think, um, I, you know, maybe if it's possible, you might be able to take a look at some of these in the future as well and respond to them. And um, maybe there's a way we can distribute that. Um, I think there's time for at least one more. Um, let's just go ahead with one here from Rob. You noted that the president was not present for war games. Given the absence of a central and powerful figure in the decision-making process capable of fostering group thinking conformity, how much can we truly generalize from the war games outcomes? And I think maybe if I can also throw right onto that, which is something that you talk about in your paper with, with Eric and Jackie, which is how, when can you feel more confident about the external validity of these games? Because I think that that's that, what that question is getting at. You know, how can you know that this is something that you can generalize from? What were, what were your feelings on that? That, that is a, a, a very interesting question in the way that, that, that Rob asked it, because I think about it in, in a different way. The fact that Schelling said that presidents should not participate in war games because in doing so, they would be telegraphing what they would do in a real world crisis. Um, suggests to me that we've at least met some standard of whether this simulation is uh, externally valid or not. 
right? If they weren't externally valid, if we were uh, talking about hypotheticals that we didn't expect to uh, happen in, uh, in the real world, or uh, we, were, we were talking about engaging in deliberation that of a very different variety than would happen in the situation room, um, then we wouldn't be concerned about presidents telegraphing uh, in war games. So I, I see that as a, as a value, kind of an input on the, on the uh, a check in the, in the column of, yeah, they're more externally valid because of this. Um, what's then Im important to note um, for Rob is that, yeah, they're, they're not there. And so you don't have that centralizing groupthink figure, but then isn't it fascinating that we still see the influence of the president, even though the president is not there, or even though anybody on the team is not playing the president, right? They're, the, the games where, you know, they have a discussion about what President Johnson is saying in his debates with Barry Goldwater, it means that the president is there in the room and the president's uh, intended uh, uh, national security strategy and policy making, foreign policy goals, right? They're all there in the heads of the players. Uh, and so you still see that influence. Uh, and I'm, I'm right there with, with Rob thinking that if the, if the president was in fact in the room, you'd see it even more, um, uh, um, maybe group, group think or at least hierarchically driven thinking uh, in that regard. Uh, but maybe we can simulate this, right? Maybe we just, uh, what is the basic difference between games where you assign somebody to be a president or, and not? That's, that's just a basic uh, variation we, we might be able to try and tell the difference between, see if there's any difference. Yes, and I think, you know, it's a nice way to finish your talk because I notice so often at the end of every of your answers, you proposed a research question, uh, which really shows how much, there's just how much work is available to be done in this area. And I think, you know, one of the things that's come out of so much out of the, the people's questions, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but recurring was always this thing about what's going on inside the game, right? A way of being able to record that dimension. And you mentioned it as well yourself and these innovations about biometric data and stuff like this, this feeling that the, 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 the outputs that we can see, the decisions and the outcomes, there's an instinct that a lot of us seem to have here, which is we know we're missing something. We're missing something critical that's going on. And, and, and that seems to be the fact that so many people are asking that question to me is an indication that that's a really promising research program. Um, but we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, but I do want to say thank you very much for um, your presentation and for your insights on, on this research and your own experience you, going through it and also doing thinking about wargaming as a social science method. Uh, and I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who attended. Uh, I'm sorry for those who didn't get a chance to have their questions asked, but I think this is always the rub in these kinds of situations. There's a demand and supply problem. Uh, but thank you everyone for attending. And please thank do you. keep- I should say, but please everyone feel, feel welcome to email me your question. I'm, I'm happy to continue the discussion. Thank you so much for listening. Yes, yes, please, absolutely. Um, really fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Please everyone keep track of uh, more King's uh, uh, Wargaming Network events. We have uh, uh, Jacqueline Snyder coming up next in the series who uh, Reed has co-authored with. Keep an eye on the work that Reed is doing. Uh, you can check out his work on his website. Um, and uh, thank you very much everyone for attending.